So the Schulze method is a method for determining the winner of a preferential ballot election. Now remember, a preferential ballot election uses preferential ballots. So for example, uh, the first voter, voter number one, might have the preferences in order of A, B, D, or C, where A, B, D, and C represent the candidates in the election. For example, Anderson, Brown, Davis, and Chang, for example, who are running for uh, governor. Maybe voter number two, though, has a different set of preferences, and voter number three has yet another set of preferences, and so on. And the question is, when you have a preferential ballot election, you have all this data, now how do you determine the winner of that election? Well, there are some first ideas that occur to you. For, for example, you could just see who gets the most first choice votes. That's called the plurality method. Or you could decide, well, let's do something called instant runoff voting. And you could eliminate one candidate at a time based on who has the fewest uh, first choice votes at any given uh, round of the process. And there are other methods we've discussed as well. And as you get more sophisticated in terms of your way of determining the winner, you can get uh, methods with better properties. And one of the very best methods is the Schulze method. It's a little bit more complicated than these other methods, still reasonable for uh, people to understand, but it has some very, very desirable properties. In fact, the Schulze method is my second favorite method for determining the winner of a preferential ballot election. It's a close second only to ranked pairs. So how does the Schulze method work? Well, first of all, it's based on the margin of victory matrix. Now, this margin of victory matrix, which has its own video, is a fundamental uh, concept, which looks at all pairwise matchups. So, for example, you might say, let's look at all of these ballots, and let's look at A versus B, for example. So you can see in this example election, A beats B on this first ballot, A beats B on the second ballot, A beats B on this third ballot. And in total, uh, let's suppose that A beats B uh, 37 to 17, uh, which is by a total of 20 votes, 37 minus 17 votes. The key number we want to focus on is the 20. The 20 represents the number of people that preferred A over B uh, minus the number of people that preferred B over A. And we can put that number right here in the margin of victory matrix. This says that A Candidate A, Anderson, beats candidate B, Brown, by 20 votes. But the margin of victory matrix has all the pairwise matchups. So if it were just A versus C and no other candidates in the election, then you see that A beats C by negative 25 votes, which means that actually C beats A uh, by 25 votes. And this matrix has to be anti-symmetric because if, if uh, A loses to C by 25 votes, that means C actually beats A by 25 votes in this row and column. So this has all the information of all the pairwise matchups that you could possibly be interested in for the election. Now, there is another way to encode all this information, and that is by putting all your candidates uh, spatially as represented and then draw arrows between them. So, for example, this blue arrow with the 20 next to it means that A beats B by 20 votes, and then this uh, arrow means that B beats C by 30 votes. And notice that B beats C by 30 votes, so if I go to the B row and the column C, then you see that B beats C by 30 votes. And then, of course, that's a negative 30. It's just saying C loses to B by 30 votes. And so this uh, picture here is another way of encoding all the pairwise matchups uh, that's in the margin of victory matrix. So this is really fundamental. Before we go on to the Schulze method, we should represent the fact that these two ways of representing the election are representing fundamental information. Now, why would I call pairwise matchups fundamental information, well, it's because that's where democracy is, is well understood. We may get confused as to who's the winner of this preferential ballot election. We may have a debate about that. But what we don't have a debate about is that the voters like A more than B. This is uh, a fact, right? Because if you ask the voters wh which candidate do you prefer, A or B, A wins. So democracy is not complicated in when you only have two choices. It's simply the most votes wins. So that's fun, a fundamental concept in democracy. And so these are your fundamental numbers. Now the question is, how are we going to use these numbers? And in this series of lectures, we've discussed a variety of methods that use these methods. You've got the border count. Um, you've got the instant runoff border. You've got worst defeat, the Schulze method, and also ranked pairs, all discussed in this series of videos. So what are we going to do? Well, 
you remember if you look back at the other video on worst defeat, you could simply look at who has the least worst worst defeat, for example, and you can see that the worst defeat for A is a minus 25, for B it's a minus 20. Remember, negative numbers are bad in your row, it means you lose to somebody. C has a worst defeat of minus 30, but candidate D here only has a worst defeat of minus five, uh, excuse me, minus 10, right? So minus 10 is the worst defeat for D, and that's the least worst worst defeat for all the other candidates. Everyone else has a, a, a bigger negative number, right? Negative 30, negative 20, and negative 25. Technically smaller, but you know, bigger in absolute value. So we, and worst defeat says that D wins. Well, guess what? Uh, the Scholes method also says that D wins, but for a more complicated reason. And so if you're not a mathematician, this may be a bit confusing. If you are a mathematician, you're about to see some really beautiful uh, analysis here. So Scholz looks at chains between candidates. And it so happens that D wins this election according to Scholz. And here's the reason why. The Scholz method works by looking at chains of victories. So D beats A by 15 votes is a chain of length 1 from D to A. A more interesting chain is how you can go from A to D. So you'll notice that A doesn't beat D, but what I can do is I, I notice that A beats B, and B beats C, and C beats D. So you actually have a chain going from A to D. So A beats B by 20 votes, B beats C by 30 votes, and C beats D by 10 votes. Now, you may recall that the strength of a chain is the strength of the weakest link. So for example, uh, the smallest number in this chain is 10, so we say the strength of this chain is equal to 10. Now here we have a chain of length 1, and we can say the strength is equal to, therefore, just the strength of that one uh, link, which is 15. Now 15 is bigger than 10, and so we can say that this chain is a stronger chain than that chain. Now the reason I mention these two chains is this is actually the strongest chain from D to A. So just D already beats A, so there's no other way to get a strong chain. If you try to go D to B, you actually would get a negative 5 there, right? so that'd be a very weak chain. And this would be a negative 10 if you tried to go that way. So here we have that the strongest chain from D to A is stronger than the strongest chain from A to D. Now why is that the strongest chain from A to D? Well, Again, there's only one way to go out, and then from B you could go this way, but then the strength would only be 5. So let's go this way. Now this way you have a, a, strength, a chain of strength 20 so far. You have to do, go over this link of strength 10, but you can actually get something of strength uh, 10 this way, whereas if you went the other way, it would only be strength 5. And you can play around with all the possibilities this is the, and see this is the strongest chain from A to D. So since the strongest chain from D to A is stronger than the strongest chain from A to D, what we can then say is, is that D chain beats A. So that double greater than sign is what we call, you would, you would say, I like to call it chain beats. So it's also true, of course, that D beats A by 15 votes, but that's not what the Scholz method is based on. The Scholz method is on, based on these chain beats, and it turns out that D chain beats A because of this relationship. Now it turns out that D also chain beats B. Now why is that? D also chain beats B since the strongest chain from D to B is stronger than the strongest chain from B to D. So let's just analyze this for a second. The strongest chain from D to B. How do we do that? Well, D beats A that beats B, so that's a chain from D to B. And is it the strongest chain? Well, you get a negative number if you went over any of these arrows. So you get positive, and then there's really no other way to go. So this is clearly the strongest chain from D to B. And we can see that the strength of this chain gets the smallest uh, number here. It's the weakest length, if you like. So the strength of this chain is equal to 15. And that's a stronger chain than the strongest chain from B to D. Okay, so how do you go from B to D? Well, you could just go straight from B to D, but that would be a chain of only strength 5. You also can go B beats C, C beats D. Now that has a strength of 10, and it turns out that's the strongest chain. There's only, only those two possibilities to consider. Now the strength of this chain, of course, is only 10. And so, therefore, this chain with strength 15 is stronger than this chain, which only has a strength of 10. So we write 
that D also chain beats candidate B. Finally, candidate D also chain beats candidate C because the strongest chain from D to C is stronger than the strongest chain from C to D. Now the strongest chain from C to D is just 10 because C beats D. You could try going up this way, but then uh, there's no way to get back to D without getting a, a, a strength of 5 there or just coming back where you already were and getting a strength of 10. So the strongest chain from C to D is strength 10. Uh, and by the way, another way you can see that the strongest chain from C to D can't ever be anything stronger than 10 is that D only has a loss of 10. So this is uh, one uh, connection that uh, these, the Scholz method has to the, the worst defeat method is that since D's worst defeat is 10, it's impossible to have a chain that goes from one candidate to another that is stronger than uh, 10. Now the strongest chain from D to C, let's see, it's D, A, B, C, so it's going all the way around like this, and you can see that D actually only beats A, so you have to start out with A, and then from there you have to go to B. And if you go this way, then, then um, well, you're not getting help getting towards where your goal, which is C, and so you can see the strongest chain from D to C is this chain, which has a strength of equal to 15. compared to this chain, which of course has a strength of 10. So, therefore, D chain beats C. Now, turns out that the Scholzen method defines the winner of the election to be any candidate that can chain beat everyone else. And you might say, well, wait a second, I see that D chain beats A and D chain beats B and D chain beats C, but how do I know that maybe some other candidate, like maybe candidate A, chain beats everyone, for example? Well, you can see that can't happen because D already chain beats A. So it's impossible for A to chain beat everyone else because it can't chain beat D. So we know that there's at most one candidate that chain beats everyone else. But how do we know there's any candidates that chain beats everyone else? Well, that's a very interesting theorem. And if you're a mathematician, you're going to love the Scholzen method. The Scholzen method actually has beautiful theorems, and turns out there's the, a, one of the main results theorem is that there exists a unique candidate that we'll call the Scholzen winner that chain beats everyone else. all of the candidates. And that's a beautiful result in mathematics. So I think it's quite remarkable that this Scholzen method here was discovered by uh, someone you know, so recently in the 2000s. Now, I don't have time in this video to prove this theorem. There exists a unique candidate that chain beats all other candidates, but it's a true statement. I should go ahead and qualify what makes it true. We're going to, we need to assume that all of the margins of victory here, that all these numbers in this chart are all different. So there's the question of ties. So notice how uh, if this were a 15 and that were also a 15, then that can cause problems. But we're going to assume that there is a tie-breaking ballot that is interpreted in such a way as to make all these green numbers here uh, distinct, uh, different from each other. And so if that's true, then you always have a unique uh, candidate that chain beats all other candidates. And the proof of that is really far from obvious. Uh, you can try to come up with examples. You'll see that there's always a candidate that chain beats everyone else. Uh, but then the actual proof is really something that mathematicians really uh, appreciate. And it's quite clever, actually. Uh, I'll certainly give it to you as a challenge problem if you want to try to prove that yourself. But don't be discouraged when you can't prove it, actually. I think it's uh, you really probably need to be a professional mathematician to have a, a good shot at being able to prove that. It's really quite clever, and yet uh, not uh, incredibly difficult, but it would probably take me uh, another 20 minutes of video to, to give a full proof, if not 30 minutes. So I'll put that on my list of things to do, possibly for a future video. Uh, for now, let me just summarize the situation and say that the Scholze method is a wonderful method for determining the winner of a preferential ballot election. Now you might wonder, why do I like it? For example, this seems pretty complicated. But what's 
makes the Scholes method better than every other method we've discussed, um, except for ranked pairs in my opinion, is that it has so many good properties. So the properties that the Scholes method have uh, include It's Condorcet. Now, what does that mean? It, it means that if there's one candidate that beats all other candidates in head-to-head -head matchups, then that candidate will be the Scholes winner. So to me, that's a very, very important property because that means the game theory of the Scholes method, if you're a political candidate, is to be as centrist as possible or to persuade the electorate you're as, as centrist as possible. The other thing it has is that it's clone invariant. So that means that political parties are not as important. You don't need to uh, have one candidate on the left versus one candidate on the right. You can have as many candidates from each political party as you want and candidates that are similar to each other won't penalize or reward each other. It's also monotone. And if you look back at another video I made on uh, instant runoff voting uh, and monotonicity, I pointed out that instant runoff voting is not monotone. And what that means is there are actually situations with instant runoff voting where if a candidate gets too many people voting for them, they can lose the election, which is ridiculous, right? It's, uh, if you get more votes, that should never cost you the election. So uh, the Scholes and Methods monotone. And it has other uh, properties as well. Uh, but those are the, the three big ones. So this monotonicity allows voters or encourages voters to vote honestly. So I think that's important. It rewards centrist candidates because it's a Condorcet method. And it allows as many candidates as you like to run the election without uh, penalizing each other for being, having similar political views. Uh, very much. Okay, so there's, uh, there's more to discuss there. But these are three really, really good properties that the Scholes and Method has. And for this reason, it's my second favorite method for determining the winner of a preferential ballot election, second only to ranked pairs.